Habits and Health, episode 38. Welcome to the Habits and Health podcast, where we believe creating healthy habits should be easy. Brought to you by an educator and coach for anyone who wants to create a healthier life. Here's your host, Tony Winyard. Welcome to another edition of the podcast where we give you ideas to improve your health in uh, various ways. Today's episode is Robert J. Davis, PhD, who's known as the Healthy Skeptic. He's an award-winning health journalist whose work has appeared on CNN, PBS, WebMD, and in a Wall Street Journal. He's an author of three previous books on health. He hosts the Healthy Skeptic video series, which dissects the science behind popular health claims. And he holds an undergraduate degree from Princeton University, a master's degree in public health, and a PhD in health policy. And we have a really good chat about some of the myths that prevail around health and um, we dig into some of the biggest ones and some of the research he did uh, around his current book, which was just released uh, a few months ago. Hope you enjoy this episode. Habits and Health, um, my guest today is Robert Davis. How are you, Robert? Hi, Tony. I'm great. Great to be with you. It's good to have you here. And you're the author of a, a very new book that's just been released a few weeks ago. Yes, a book called Supersize Lies, uh, and how it, the t- subtitle is How Myths About Weight Loss Are Keeping Us Fat and the Truth About What Really Works. So it's, it's a myth-busting book. I try to look at, all, sort through all the many claims we hear, confusing and conflicting claims about weight management, and look at the science, and actually dig into the science using my background in public health and epidemiology, and to, to lay out what's true, what's not true, what's half true, so that readers can make better decisions for themselves. Well, I think this is going to be fascinating going into to some of that. So just before we get into that, so where, where are you based? I'm in Los Angeles, California. And is that where, are you a native of LA? I'm not. I'm a native of the other side of the U.S., but I've lived here for a few years. I, what was it that got you, did you get into health first or journalism first or what was what your background? You know, I have had a passion regarding health, nutrition, fitness since I was in college. And so I've also had a long interest in journalism. I was a high school journalist. And so I uh, have combined those passions working as a health journalist throughout my career. Um, I also have training, as I mentioned, in public health, uh, academic training. I have a PhD in health policy, master's degree in, in public health. And so I've tried to bring to bear all those things in my work, my passion, my personal passion, as well as my academic training and my work. um, I've I've written several uh, previous books. I also produce videos and and, uh, write things. And so what I try to do in all my work is actually look at the science and, as I say, sort of do things that most people either don't want to do or don't have the training to do to actually look at the studies, lay out the science as clearly and thoroughly and honestly as I can um, and, and so my brand is called The Healthy Skeptic, and, and that is sort of a science-based approach to all these claims we often get around health. So what, what was the first book you did? The first book is actually called The Healthy Skeptic, and that name is obviously I use for my brand. And that book looked at uh, a number of different health claims, everything from dietary supplements, the things in the U.S. that are sold, they're unregulated, um, herbs and vitamins and minerals and so forth to uh, claims about cholesterol, to diets. I focus somewhat on diets in that book as well. A number of different health and wellness claims and try to look at the story behind the stories. Who is responsible for these claims we hear? Who's responsible for this advice, whether it's the government, interest groups, others, and what often are their hidden motivations? What, what is driving them to put out this information? And how are those motives often uh, distorting the information that they put out and misleading us? Um, so it was a sort of a general look at health advice and the various forces, including money, that often distort the information we get. And, and when was that published? That was published in 2008. Okay, so you've had what 12 years or 13 years of writing or book writing experience. Yes, yes, and several and in, in, in two and three since then. This being my fourth and most recent. And it, has it got easier? Uh, it does not get easier. I wish I could say that it does. Um, each one has its own challenges. I love the process, but each, when I finish each one, I say, you know, I'm not going through this again. This has been difficult. And then I, for whatever reason, I decided to do another one. So, uh, but no, it has not gotten easier, but I, each one I've enjoyed doing. 
So how long, so for this one, how long did it take you to do the research and and everything around it? A little over a year. So, um, and and I I will say maybe it was faster than I might have done otherwise because I happened to start it right before the the pandemic hit. And so I was writing it uh, during the last year, 2020. Uh, And so I didn't have many other distractions. And so that's always helpful when you don't have, when, when you don't have much else to do, you just stay at your desk. And actually it turned out to be a good thing because not only did I not have many other distractions to keep me from my writing, but also it was a good distraction to keep me focused on this and maybe pay less attention to all the terrible things that, that all of us were, were dealing with during the pandemic. So uh, it turned out to be a blessing, the, 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 the timing, actually. And what was the inspiration for it in the first place? The inspiration was that I know I have family uh, members and friends who've struggled their entire lives with their weight. So certainly I've seen firsthand what they've gone through and continue to go through. And also just in my work over the years and and seeing the numbers of uh, claims, misleading claims and uh, misinformation that's out there when it comes to weight loss. I mean, perhaps this this issue affects uh, more people than anything else because so many people Certainly in the United States, and I know in the UK, other countries uh, have struggled with their weight, and we know that the obesity epidemic is a growing problem, uh, despite all kinds of efforts to try to address it. And so I thought that, number one, it's a very important issue from a public health standpoint, but also such an important issue for so many people personally. And given what I do, which is, try, as I say, trying to look at the science and set the record straight, I, I just thought this was a very important issue for me to focus on exclusively in one book. I mean, I imagine in the course of the research that you did, you, there's a few things that probably surprised you. Can you think of any particular surprises when you were doing the research? Yeah, well, I, you know, there were a number of surprises. A lot of these things, as you can imagine, I've reported on in the past. Um, I think, you know, one is that I, in the U.S., we rely on a measurement often called BMI, body mass index. And that's standard in many countries. It's, it's sort of the standard for determining whether somebody uh, is obese or normal weight or somewhere in between and whether... Uh, their health is jeopardized as a result. And what I found is that this measurement, I always knew that there were problems with the measurement, but I think the reporting for this book really brought home to me just how inadequate this measure is and how misleading it is in terms of labeling people as obese and at greater risk of uh, metabolic disease when in fact they're not. And conversely, labeling people as normal and quote, okay, when they're not. And so how, how, how uh, distorting this can be, not only in the way that we label people, but also have people perceive their own risk. And um, again, I, I talk about, I have an entire chapter focused on this, but I think that was one issue that I think I gained, gained an even greater appreciation for the problems that we have. And can you see that ever changing? And why do, do, why do people still use BMI? Well, that's a great question. I think it, it, because it's simple. It involves only height and weight, and it's easy to calculate. That's number one. Number two mm. is there's not a great alternative that's easy to use. Now, people can, there are methods that are, are available to measure body fat that are far more accurate, uh, underwater weighing and so forth, but they tend to be more difficult to do. They're not as convenient. They can be expensive. And there are other uh, things that people sometimes use, for, including measuring waist circumference. That's one thing that's sometimes proposed as an alternative. The problem with that is that that, that sometimes uh, people, I know when someone measures my waist, I tend to suck in my stomach. So that's not foolproof either. Uh, It can be affected if people have eaten recently. And there are questions about where the cutoff should be, above what level is uh, is dangerous. So Hmm. I think that uh, it may be better, but it's not perfect either. So the short answer to the question is we don't have great alternatives. And so because of that, um, because there aren't great alternatives, we've sort of an inertia has just uh, resulted in our sticking with the BMI. Hmm. Well, I mean, so the book is called Supersized Lies. Which which of the lies do you think is most that that people really believe the most of the, the lies that are out there about around health? I'd say a couple. One is this idea that weight loss is simply about eat less and move more. E L M M. It's sometimes called. Uh, and, Mm -hmm. and to me, that's perhaps the biggest myth because weight loss is far more complicated than that. Uh, it involves psychology, it involves genetics, it involves environment, it involves biology, hormonal and metabolic issues that vary from person to person in addition to what we eat and, and so, and how we move our bodies. And so there are a number of factors. And I think that when people are told simply all it involves, eat less, move more, exercise, watch your calorie intake and you'll lose weight. 
Um, it's a gross oversimplification. Obviously, if that were the answer, then people, more people would be succeeding in their efforts to lose weight, and they're not. And not only are they not succeeding, they're gaining weight. So I think that that's, mm. that's a huge factor, uh, and, and it's a problem. And, and the other side of that is that often when people fail, they're told, okay, well, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to eat less, I'm trying to exercise more, and I'm not losing weight. They blame themselves, and they think of themselves as failures. Mm. And that's one of the terrible side effects of this misinformation, because the problem is not their efforts necessarily. The problem is the advice. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the t- when I saw first saw the cover of the book and I saw Super Size and it made me think about, is this any, I, there was a, I seem to remember a documentary a few years right. ago called Super Size Me or something. Yes, exactly. So immediately the thoughts go to McDonald's and some of the misinformation i suppose you could say that companies like that spread right well that's where the name came from because i I wanted to do a play on that and not 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 to steal from that documentary but it was the you know the the, and that name that super size came originally from when i don't believe they do it anymore mcdonald's would have would label their the sizes they went you know meet small medium large super size me and get even larger size fries or whatever and so um I think that uh, if that ter- if that adjectives can apply to French fry or fries, it can also apply to the myths and the lies that we hear. Mm. How is the what's the reaction been so far to the book? I've been very gratified, very happy with the, with the reaction, particularly from people. And thing, what matters most to me is when I hear from people and read reviews from people who struggle with their weight, who are exactly the kinds of people I'm trying to address who in, in some cases, lifelong struggles with their weight and gone through many different diets and many different plans to, to reduce and not found success. And they say that this book is helpful to them in trying to help them cut through all the hype and all the misinformation to get to what really may help them. And so, and, and to help them understand also it's not their fault. So again, that's been very gratifying to hear from those folks, especially um, to find that they find the book helpful. Have people cited any particular sort of stories or examples that have really resonated with them? Well, you know, I, I in the book, I do have a number of stories that I include. Uh, and some of the people have commented on the stories from the uh, real people who've experienced this and telling about the struggles they went through trying different approaches and then discovering what worked for them. Because, you know, that's a big part of this is figuring out what works for you instead of mm-hmm. following some one size fits all diet. And, and, but, but it's showing in the process, some of these folks, how their efforts over and over and over to try these one size fits all approaches really were harmful to them. They, 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 Mm -hmm. it it caused not only physical harm, but also emotional harm. And so I think those stories, Mm -hmm. uh, people can identify with those stories who've been through this. Can you um, recall any of the stories I found that you could maybe give? Well, uh, you know, just one small example. I I talk, I, I, I tell the story of a woman who, struggle with her weight for many years. She would go on low calorie diets, lose the weight for some event or some occasion. Uh, and, or she just had a goal. She wanted to lose the weight, would lose the weight, uh, and then gain the weight back and then go on another diet, a low calorie diet, lose the weight and then gain even more. And she talks about how this obsession with calorie counting and these very low calorie diets prevented her from living her life. She said she would look at menus. People invite her to dinner and she would look at the menu beforehand and see if there was some low calorie item on the menu. If there wasn't, she would find an excuse not to go to dinner with people. She would dread going to weddings and events like that. They weren't sources of, of, of pleasure and joy. They were pleasures. They were sources of dread because she would hate the thought of, well, am I going to eat cake? Well, what's going to happen here? And so I think that kind of thing can really, I think, drive home the point that this struggle against weight and, and some of the methods that we've been told we're supposed to follow um, the, the, the damage they can cause and really interfere with people's quality of life. When you, when you set out to write the book, did you have a particular type of person in mind? Yeah, I think I wanted to uh, appeal to people who, and this is a broad, broad wide swath of people, who struggled in, w- with their weight. That may be some people who struggled to lose 10 or 20 pounds and haven't been able to, and that also may be people who've been struggling to lose more than 100 pounds. But people who've who've had trouble figuring out what to do when it comes to their weight and uh, have, have been confused about different, uh, what to do, or maybe have tried different things and found that something does maybe works in the short term and doesn't work in the long term. So yes, I, I, I wanted to appeal to people who struggled in whatever way, uh, both men, women, young, old, um, who, who have found that the traditional approaches, things they've been told they should try don't work for them. 
So we've discussed at the moment, you just talked about how so often so-called experts, you know, talk about a particular diet that's going to work for everyone, which is clearly not true. And you, you've spoken about BMI. Is there anything else you think that people who are maybe not so familiar with health or not so knowledgeable in health will be maybe quite surprised by in your book? You know, maybe something else is this idea that, and, and this is an idea behind so many of the diets we encounter, is that it's simply about villains, getting rid of whatever particular villain that diet um, labels as as a culprit. So we see, mm. we, we go back several decades when fat was the villain, at least in the U.S. and I think other countries as well. Uh, so the, the, con- the conventional thinking was, if you cut out fat, fat is bad. If you'll cut out fat from your diet, then it'll help you lose weight. Well, that turned out not only to be false, but some argue that it made the problem worse because we ended up having not only people getting fatter, but we had an epidemic of diabetes that occurred. And then the mm. next culprit was carbs. So uh, the, the thinking was that if you just cut out carbs, carbs are the enemy, then that will be the solution. And that obviously it's far more complex than that. And then since then, we have other villains, whether it's gluten, uh, whether it's sugar, um, whether it's you know uh, detox diets, whatever the case may be, we have a number of diets that identify specific villains. And I think that is an idea that is misleading and even dangerous because what happens is not only uh, is it very difficult for, for people to sustain those diets over time because they're depriving themselves, but also in the process, they can deprive themselves of certain nutrients they need. If, for example, they go, say, on a keto diet long term, mm-hmm. um, they're going to not be able to eat certain eat fruits, vegetables, whole grains that are necessary for good nutrition. So that's not to say a keto diet never works. It's not to say nobody should do the keto diet, but it is to say for many people, it's certainly not optimal. And and yet people are led to believe that that diet or some other diet is the way to go because it bans some particular food or, or category of foods. We hope you're enjoying this episode of the Habits and Health podcast, where we believe creating healthy habits should be easy. If you're looking for the fastest and most effective way to transform your energy and well-being, we invite you to join Tony for an upcoming Habits and Health workshop. This five-week group workshop will empower you with tools to disrupt unwanted habits and make positive changes easy. You'll enjoy sounder sleep, better energy, less stress and a happier mood. Workshops begin on the first week of every month and you can sign up now at tonywinyard.com. Now, back to the show. So what would you say to to a person who's not knowledgeable in health and they meet uh, a so-called expert or someone, maybe a, a coach or someone who's selling some kind of a service and without knowing anything about the person's metabolism, about their health history, straight away recommends, oh, this is how you should be eating. What, what would you say to someone who gets that kind of advice? I would say they should be very skeptical. They should be a healthy skeptic. And the reason they should is that, as we said, this is a highly individualized uh, thing when it comes to weight management. And that, and that somebody who's making a recommendation to you should understand a lot about you first, should understand what your lifestyle is, should understand what your preferences are when it comes to food, to understand what you're eating. Where, where are you starting? Are you starting from a place where you're eating all junk food? Are you starting in a place where you're eating more healthful diet? Um, what are your family obligations? What are, you know, how, what, are, what is your time frame like in terms of your ability to focus on your diet? And then also, what is your metabolic health? What, what, what kind of health are you when it comes to your blood sugar and your cholesterol and your heart health overall. So I think those are all factors that need to be considered and there are plenty of others as well. But the point is that we need to, um, we need to look at all those factors as we're considering what to do. And I lay out in the book, some general principles that people, that everybody can follow, but these are principles that can be tailored to each individual based on your preferences, your lifestyle, your situation. What, What would you hope that, um, what would you hope that most people get from this book? A couple of things. First of all, I hope that they will be more uh, skeptical and more discerning when they encounter this advice, whether it's from the internet or whether it's from the news stories or whether it's from other people uh, about this advice, particularly these, you know, this is the secret to weight loss. This diet is something you have to follow, number one. And number two is I hope it will also make them more hopeful and not give up because sometimes people just throw up their hands and say, I've tried all these things, nothing works. I'm just going to eat whatever I want, or I'm not going to worry about it. And that's not a good approach either. So I think that I hope that it will help dispel that idea and help people know that there are science-backed 
principles that they can follow and that there is a road to finding a success if you have the right expectations and if you follow the right advice. And so I hope it can provide some hope to people. Do you have any thoughts on how you see in the next few, maybe five, 10 years, um, the field of health and and the way that food is sold and, and marketed in, in general and, and not, just, not just food and, but also diets and, and so on. Can you see, how, how do you think things might progress? Well, in I, I'm, I'm hopeful we're not there yet. Uh, and sometimes people say we are, but we're not, but I'm hopeful that we can move more toward what's called precision medicine with a greater mm-hmm. understanding of the genetics and metabolism and various uh, features of each individual to be able to tailor diets in a way that can really help individuals based on their own biology. So, you know, sometimes we mm-hmm. see that, oh, well, if you're this type of person or you have this type of blood type or you, you have this genetic profile, uh, then you should follow this diet. Right now, that's not believable. We just, we're not there yet with the science. But, I, but legitimate science is uh, moving in that direction. So I hope, I don't know how many years, over five, 10 years, whatever it is, 20 years, we can certainly move in that direction more. And I think that ultimately may be the answer. I mean, it's something that you've, you've kind of touched upon anyway, but I want to kind of highlight it is something that I hear a lot is a lot of people, I, say, I, I often see it on, on social media, especially Facebook, where someone will say, um, oh, what supplements should I be taking? What supplements do you take what, you know, that, I, that would be really good for me? And I always think, well, these people who are giving you recommendations don't know anything about you. What, what do you think people should, how, how should people go about trying to find the right supplements for themselves? Yeah, that's a hard thing. At least in the U.S., they're very uh, poorly regulated. There's only loose regulation. Uh, and mm-hmm. so in the U.S., manufacturers can claim pretty much anything they want. They can use certain wording to get around the law and imply that their uh, supplement helps you lose weight or whatever it is. And, uh, and, and there's no testing for safety beforehand that's required. So the only way to find out if something's dangerous is actually when it starts causing harms to people and then it can be taken off the market. But even then it's difficult. So, um, my advice to people is that for certain things, whether it's, uh, cholesterol or vitamin def- mineral deficiencies, supplements can be helpful. Uh, and there's certain supplements certainly that are, uh, have been proven to be helpful and, can, can, and I think can benefit health. Um, and there, and there are, uh, honest sellers on the other hand, when it comes to weight loss, which is what obviously we're talking about here. Um, despite the fact there are so many supplements, none is, re- is really proven to be effective. Uh, many compl- uh, contain a combination of ingredients that have never been tested together. So even if one ingredient may in some studies show some benefit, we don't know what's going to happen when you can combine those ingredients and whether even that's safe. So I would advise people when it comes to weight loss to be very, very cautious of supplements um, because none has been proven to be effective or safe. In general, though, if people are interested in supplements, there's certain uh, uh, websites, Consumer Lab being one, consumerlab.com, that actually test supplements to make sure they actually contain what's listed on the label and they actually present the evidence for various conditions around certain supplements. A lab, a, a lab door, I believe, is another one. Um, that have this service. So I would suggest that if people are considering purchasing supplements um, to look to, ser- to uh, services such as those rather than just believing claims they read on the internet. And what do you think about, there's, there's a lot of tests being offered to the public now, these various sort of genetic tests, DNA tests and so on. What, what would you think about those? Yeah, I think for the most part, again, this uh, research is in its infancy. And ma- in many cases, these tests promise to deliver more than they actually can. So I would say that people should view those also with great caution and uh, to, to do some more research on their own to determine whether the test that's being offered really has the science behind it that the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the people selling these tests claim. You, you talked before about, um, in your, when you, after your previous books, you thought, I'm not going to do any more. So is this, is this going to be your last one? Or do you th- well, I, you know, you, maybe you should ask me the question in a year. I don't know. I would say that there are plenty of other subjects I would like to tackle. There's no shortage of subjects that require, I think, more scrutiny of the claims that we hear. Certainly, we, when we just talked about dietary supplements, uh, you know, I thought maybe about tackling that one because there's so much misinformation. And and again, I'm not anti-supplement. I think supplements can be beneficial in certain cases, but it's a matter of figuring out Mm -hmm. what those situations are. And so that's certainly one that I think would be um, appropriate to look at in the future in a book. Is there a book 
that has really moved you for for any reason that you can rem- you can remember? Well, you know, I read a book uh, re- a few a couple of years ago by a, a, a reporter, Wall Street Journal reporter named John Carreyrou. Uh, and and that's a book that's gotten a lot of attention. For at least people in the U.S. are familiar with what the subject is. It's a the, the uh, a woman named Elizabeth, a young woman named Elizabeth Holmes, who started a company called Theranos here in the United States. And this was a company that promised to revolutionize um, uh, blood testing. Uh, and so uh, it was it became the darling of Silicon Valley. She raised hundreds of millions of dollars from all kinds of smart, sophisticated investors. As it turned out, it was just a fraud. It, she, the technology wasn't there, and yet all these people were fooled. And so this book uh, details how this fraud was perpetrated, but it also shows how the reporter went about uncovering this. And the, and the reason the book really resonated with me, and it's because it really relates to my life's work, um, mm. and first of all, just how easily we can be deceived, including people who are very smart and very well-educated, and how a bias can take over this, in this case, groupthink and the bandwagon effect that everybody believes something. And so everybody jumps on and other people believe it. So how very smart people believe that this kind of testing was possible just because somebody who was charismatic and attractive and smart said it was true. And so it, it carries over to the work I do because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to point out constantly to people, just because somebody you believe says this, just somebody who seems impressive says this about your health, don't take it at face value. And that's a lesson I repeat over and over and over to people. Um, and, and, and so that and this was, I think, a f- fantastic example of how of how this idea can happen on a mass scale, uh, the way that people um, really made her a darling and believe what she was saying. And the second thing, I think the reason the book really resonates with me is the power of journalism and good reporting to help dispel these narratives and, and, and help people see the truth. And, and I know journalism, rightly so, has taken a beating in recent years. Um, and there are all kinds of problems with journalism. So I'm not one to defend all the, the, uh, the, the issues in journalism. But certainly I think journalism at its best and reporting at its best uh, serves a vital role to help us see the truth and to help us get closer to the truth. And again, to cut through these narratives and these stories that are misleading. One thing I'd like to get your thoughts on would be on the various wearables that are available now. There's so many different wearables and there's many more on the horizon, like sort of um, continuous glucose monitors and, and, and various other things. Do you have any thoughts on any, any of that kind of thing? Yeah, well, I can speak to at least when it comes to tracking weight. So that's something that I wrote about in the book, tracking calories and so forth. I mean, generally, the wearables, uh, people use them to track their calories. Uh, they're not good for that. So I think people need to be cautious of any calorie counts in terms of you've burned this many calories today from your workout that, that, that there are studies that show that they're not necessarily uh, accurate. So people should take that with, with a grain of salt. However, th- there are other things they can tell you. For example, they, they're accurate at counting your steps. So if you're counting your steps, um, that can be a good thing. Um, certainly the technology is getting better, but there are plenty of things that they don't do so well. For example, they don't do so well at recording sleep. I know there's some that people use to sort of look at their sleep and they don't really measure how much you slept. They, they look at things like how your heart rate and how much you move during the night, which may or may not be good indicators of the quality of your sleep. So I think, this again, the technology is getting better, but um, the basic things such as counting steps, I think we have. The other things, uh, in some cases, not so. It, 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 we need to do more work. Do you have any... Um, no. Has Pete, have anyone given you any indications of wearables that may really develop um, in a good way over the next sort of few years in the near future? You know, I think that one area could be, uh, and it's certainly being pushed for this now, is to help people monitor their own health. So it's mo- whether it's monitoring their blood pressure, their blood sugar, um, uh, other markers of metabolic health more easily, and communicating those with their doctor so that those kinds of things rather than people finding out they have a problem uh, farther along in the course of, 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 of a health issue, they can get early indicators, uh, early warning signs of a problem, and that information can be conveyed uh, to their health care provider early on so that action can be taken to um, prevent something worse from happening. So I think that's an area where um, the technology could be very useful in the future um, just to help prevent serious conditions. If people want to find out more about you, Robert, where, where's the best place to look? They can go to my website, which is healthyskeptic.com. And there I have information about my books, uh, how to purchase them. And also, I have a number of videos I've created. I create short videos under the Healthy Skeptic brand name on some of the topics we've talked about today and other topics. 
looking at various claims and say, and looking and dissecting the science, showing what the science really says. So those are short videos. So invite people who are interested to go look at those videos on healthyskeptic.com. And if any of the listeners are skeptical about a story they read, or if they were to write into you, uh, would you, are you able to do, I don't know, a video on a, on a a hot topic of, of the moment, for example, if someone, Sure. No, and I, I welcome that. And if people do have questions and have suggestions for videos, I've done a number of my videos I've done as a result of people writing in and saying, what about this? In some cases, I didn't know about it. So it was important for me to learn that it was a thing. It was a trend. I try to keep up with that, but there certainly are plenty of things I'm not aware of. And so that's helpful if people say they've heard about something or wondering about something, and it gives me an idea. So by all means, I encourage and, and welcome that. And is there, I mean, I'm, it's, it's from the sounds of things, you, you, is it like a blog you have in your site? So it's just, it's a website, but there's a way to contact me on the site. You just go to contact me on the site and you can write a note to me and I will get it and respond. Well, what is, what is your, your big passion in life? Is there something that really uh, you're, you're most passionate about? I would say, you know, obviously I'm passionate about health, but I think within that, you know, there's an aspect of health many people don't think of as falling under the category of health, but I do. And that is the idea of connecting with other people. And I know that may sound trite, but I think that's not only an important part of just life in general, but I think, again, I think it's studies show that people who are able to form connections with other people um, are, are healthier and, and, and lead longer lives than people who don't. And that's something that I try to focus on every day because I see it as, as a way to enhance my own well-being and to improve the quality of my life. And so it's something that requires work. We all know that. It requires staying in touch with people, reaching out to people. And that's family members and friends. And it's something that has greatly enhanced my life. I have friends that go back all the way to my childhood, a number of friends, but, but, but it's something I've worked at. But it's something that's just very, very important. And I would say it's, number, it's my number one passion in terms of enhancing the quality of my life. And, and lastly, David, is there anything I didn't, uh, sorry, David, Robert, is there anything I didn't ask you about your book that you think would be really useful for people to know? Um, I think that, uh, you know, one area we didn't discuss that, that I would just say to people, is, you know, we, in this idea that you need to eat less and exercise more, we didn't talk about exercise. One thing I would just add, because again, I'm avid exerciser and I want people to know that despite all the great things that exercise can do for you, I think it's the closest thing we have to a fountain of youth. And so I encourage everybody to move your body in whatever way you can. The one thing exercise doesn't do so well is to actually result in weight loss. And I think too often people look to that as the main reason for exercising and they end up quitting and being frustrated because exercise doesn't result in weight loss. And so I say to people, by all means, exercise, but just go in with the right expectations. It's going to help you feel better. It's going to enhance your well-being. It's going to reduce your stress. It's going to help you live longer, reduce your risk of heart disease, all the rest. But it's not necessarily going to help you lose weight. And I think if people can go in with those expectations, then they're more likely to, uh, over time, uh, enjoy exercise and stick with it. Wish you all the best success for this book, because it's a book that clearly a lot of people need to read, because um, there's so many terrible myths going around uh, around this whole these these topics so yeah best of best of luck for this book thank you so much tony it's been great talking to you thank you next week is episode 39 with dr miles nichols who is the founder of the medicine with heart clinic and the medicine with heart institute he is a, a functional medicine practitioner and he grew up in a family with um his father was a medical doctor focusing on public health and one day when Miles was uh, 15, he got a call from a family friend, uh, said he needed to go to the hospital right away and discovered that his father had suddenly and unexpectedly died from a heart attack. And that changed some of his um, thinking around medicine. And we're going to hear a lot more about that and about how he helps patients now and his views on medicine and behavior change and many other areas. So that's next week with Dr. Miles Nichols. Hope you've enjoyed this week's episode. And if you know anyone who gets some value from this, who some of the myths that uh, Robert Davis busts in this episode, please do share the episode with them. And I uh, hope you have a great week. See you next week. 
Thanks for tuning in to the Habits and Health Podcast, where we believe creating healthy habits should be easy. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Sign up for email updates and learn about coaching and workshop opportunities at TonyWinyard.com. See you next time on the Habits and Health Podcast.